Now, as a teacher, you are going to have to engage with assessment. Now, assessment is essentially at its core, your understanding of your students' learning. And ideally, your students' understanding of their own learning. And we do assessment on a continuous basis. And there are various different types of assessment that we're going to explore. But assessment literacy is your understanding of assessment processes. And indeed, assessment literacy can also apply to your students. One of the key indicators of success for high performing students is their assessment literacy, their understanding of the processes and mechanisms of assessment and how they can maximize that. So to, independent of their learning of, of the content, their ability to engage effectively with assessment techniques and, and processes can often mean that they will be much more successful in their education than their understanding of the content alone would indicate. But in the main, we're focusing on your assessment literacy and your understanding of how to conduct assessment and the reasons and ways you can do that in a more effective way. So a few different techniques. First is you need to understand the principles and practices of assessment, why we do assessment, um, some of the different elements of that. So essentially, from a teacher's perspective, we use assessment to improve our teaching and subsequent to that, our students' learning. Um, we want to help also our students with their own learning through their understanding of their progress. So while we often use assessment to provide data for us to understand students' learning, students can also use that data to understand how they're progressing. And then finally, it can provide um, a meaningful recognition of students' achievements. So for reporting to their parents, for example, for awarding certificates, for getting into university at, in senior assessment and so forth. So there are other mechanisms and reasons for assessment as well. But particularly in the primary years, the focus is on understanding students' learning so that we can improve those processes and improve their learning. <coughs> so there are a few different things that we need to understand in terms of terminology. The first is the validity of the assessment. So this is how well it aligns with the intent. Does it actually assess students' learning? If I give them an essay to write on how, um, how they can write a computer program, is that essay the most effective assessment technique to actually determine whether or not students are effective at writing a computer program? Or would a practical activity where they actually write a computer program be a more valid approach to that? Would a multiple choice quiz be an effective, valid technique to measure students' ability um, in solving a mathematics problem? So there are a whole range of different um, considerations you need to take in looking at the validity of the, the task. Um, essentially, it needs to relate to the curriculum learning outcomes, the content descriptors, and the ass accessible elements, the um, assessment, um, assessment descriptions related to their learning. If it's not measuring that, is it really valid? So a common thing we might see is we've got a whole lot of learning outcomes and then we also assess them on their spelling or at a university level, the ability to provide correct references in APA 6 format, which don't have anything actually in relation to the actual learning task. So in that case, they're not valid measures of their learning if they're learning how to become an effective teacher, for example, or if they're doing a science essay and the learning is focused on their understanding of the scientific method, spelling is not necessarily an appropriate measure of their understanding of the scientific method. Now, it may be important in terms of measuring their literacy and their processes of engaging with um, language and so forth, but 
that's not necessarily the learning outcomes that are intended. Okay, some other aspects. Uh, reliability is whether or not it's consistent and replicable. If we were to give them the same assessment task three times, would they get the same result? Or would it be widely different? Um, so reliability is the consistency nature of the assessment. Uh, sufficiency is whether or not it is enough to tell us whether or not their learning is pro progressing. If, say, I give a one question um, quiz, is that really going to give me enough information to be able to make a judgment on their learning? Likewise, sometimes we can go overboard and we might give them a huge project that takes them six weeks to measure whether or not they understand the concept of sequence, which may be achievable in a 10 minute activity. So sufficiency is something you also should consider. Accessibility is an important aspect, and this really relates to students with special needs. Um, say if they have vision impairment or some other um, disability, but also if they don't necessarily understand the context. Um, if you're giving a, a quiz that involves them interpreting going to the beach and diving into the waves and collecting seashells to students in outback Queensland who have never seen the ocean, that would be um, inaccessible to them in terms of being able to answer those questions. So accessibility means that all students should be able to demonstrate to their full potential on the assessment task, regardless of their own particular circumstances. Uh, transparency is a measure whereby we make it clear to everyone what the assessment task is about. So it's not a, it's not a surprise. It's not something that we don't know about. So the students understand that they're being assessed. They understand that they need to perform their best and so forth. And it's not some subterfuge or other ways of gathering data without their knowledge. It should be informative, provide you with information on which to make determinations. Uh, it should be evidence-based, which means essentially it's defensible. If the parents come in and say, why did Sally get a C instead of an A? Can you defend that? And you will have to defend that. <laughs> it does happen. Uh, and you need to be able to explain your assessment and why it was done in the way it was done and how it is appropriate to make a measurement and that Sally only received a C because of these reasons. And we'll be discussing some of the ways that that could be established. Okay, it should be ongoing. So you shouldn't just do assessment once and then never revisit it. There should be opportunities for students to demonstrate their understanding at multiple times. Of course, they may just be having an off day or the one time you ask them how to explain something, they just might have forgotten or just couldn't articulate it at that point in time. Whereas every other time you might ask them, they could easily do that. So ensuring that students and assessment is a continuous process is important. It should be aligned to the way you're teaching and what you're teaching. Um, it should be authentic. So that means it should relate to contextual examples that students can understand. So asking them about um, spaceships going to the moon and so forth may not be something that they can get their heads around and understand the context for. Whereas asking them about going to the shop and having to find their way there and come back is something that they can understand. It should be flexible so that it can accommodate various um, differences between your students. So not all of your students are going to be the same and your assessment tasks generally, so that they can be comparable across your students, will often need to accommodate a range of different um, capabilities of your students. And the, the more flexible your task is, the better it can achieve that. And then finally, there's a, some concepts of the types of assessment. Um, most dominant is the formative and summative assessments. Formative assessment is where you're making a measure to help in understanding students' learning. 
to improve their learning, whereas summative is generally to make some form of final judgment, say for their report card for external reporting purposes, or if they they need a, a measure to achieve a scholarship. Um, so you're making a summative judgment, whereby it's not to inform their learning, but it's generally to provide evidence to some other external body or to parents or end of year reports or prize awards for the end of the year, things like that. Okay, so that comes down to the purposes of assessment. Generally, there's three main purposes for learning, um, as learning, and of learning. So for learning, assessment occurs during the, asset, during the learning process. So generally, it's diagnostic and formative. So we're trying to find out how they're going with, their, with whatever they're learning so that we can adjust things and better support their learning. As learning is where the assessment task itself is explicitly part of that learning process. And we do that a lot in technologies education, where the process of doing the project is part of the assessment process. So we are measuring their ability to be creative and to follow procedures and to work in groups, to understand various concepts, to evaluate and to analyze as part of the assessment. So our assessment task and our learning task are really the same. And then finally, there's assessment of learning, which is most commonly associated with summative assessment, where we're making a measure of how well they've learned something. Okay, so then there's a range of different uses of these assessments. Um, initially, to provide feedback to students on how they're progressing so that they can improve and engage them and encourage them. Um, feedback to parents and caregivers so that they can understand and provide support for their children. There's the development of lifelong learning as a very high order meta goal to engage students with just the love of learning as a process. Um, improving the quality of your teaching. Uh, provision of information for certification and for certificates and awards and all that sort of stuff. And then an evaluation of programs. So not just of your teaching, but an evaluation, say, of the school program or the curriculum program in the school and so forth. OK. So there are a few different types of assessment. And you will make decisions on which types of assessment to use with your students for various learning activities and tasks. So there is generally knowledge-based assessments, uh, which measure students' understanding of different um, facts and procedures and concepts and so forth. And often we do this through multiple choice tests and quizzes and um, open-ended or matching questions and true-false questions and things like that. Then there's practical assessments, whereby students are having to perform some activity. So it might be doing a programming activity or having a robot move around a maze, things where they have to apply their understanding to do something in practice. And then there's performance-based assessments, which generally form into the area of the projects that students will work on, um, how they use tools and multimedia programs and how they create websites and do all the stuff around larger projects. And very often, practical assessments will form parts of um, performance-based assessment in terms of projects. But there's also self-assessments where students can make a measure of their own performance and how they're going, and that can be incorporated into the evaluation processes that they use in their assignments. And then we can also sometimes use peer assessment where students assess each other and provide feedback on their performance and how they're going. Now, the Queensland Curriculum and Assessment Authority provides frameworks for assessment from foundation through to year 12. Now, their focus is primarily, though, on the final two years of schooling, years 11 and 12. But their preview has ex purview has expanded to include all the years of schooling. So some of their techniques are sort of being applied all the way down into primary school. In the main, though, in primary schools, it doesn't there's no expectation for it to be as formally applied 
as the QCAA documentations would suggest. And indeed, a lot of assessments that you'll do in primary school will just be based on observations and what we term gut feeling, where you, through your understanding of your students, will build a, a good knowledge of their engagement and their capabilities without necessarily being able to explicitly articulate that. Now, of course, there will be times when you need to defend your decisions, particularly around awarding of grades and things like that. And so that's when we often use more formalized assessment techniques to provide that defensible evidence. But any good teacher, all the way up to senior schooling, generally knows exactly the performance level of their students. And assessment is often used simply to verify that. Now, sometimes, of course, teachers can develop preconceptions and we have to be careful we don't um, fall into that, where we might preconceive a student as being a particular standard, um, where in fact they may be able to demonstrate at a different standard if they're given opportunity and encouragement and engagement to do so. So you do need to be careful about preconceptions, but generally you will know your students very well and you will know exactly where they're performing on any measure of assessment and achievement levels. But that said, there are some techniques that the QCAA um, provides, and essentially there are three different approaches. Um, what are they? Uh, <laughs> essentially there's projects, or sorry, what do they call them? Um, projects, investigations, and tests. So they break assessment down into those three types. So students working on um, sort of performance-based projects, then there's practical-based investigations, which are like little mini projects, and then there is testing. But there are lots of other aspects of assessment, particularly in the primary years, that don't fall within those more formalized assessment processes. But nevertheless, you should be familiar with the QCAA guidelines and have a look at the different um, assessment techniques and conditions documents that are provided for the, the subjects and the various year levels. Now, the final aspect that you need to understand, particularly around the QCAA, is that there is an additional framework to measure student learning in addition to those that are contained in the Australian curriculum. Now, in the main, Queensland adopts the Australian curriculum, but we do have an additional framework that is essentially coming down from senior schooling, where it was initially applied and is being adopted across all the years of schooling, primarily to support what occurs in the final years in senior schooling. Um, now, the philosophical understanding of assessment and indeed of learning is contained within a document called the Taxonomies of Educational Objectives. Now, the Australian curriculum was primarily developed around what's called Bloom's Taxonomy, which was a particular framework of understanding of knowledge through to higher order thinking skills um, on a hierarchical level. Um, Mazzano's and Kendall's new taxonomy of educational objectives essentially adapts Bloom's taxonomy, but it reframes things a little, mostly informed by advances in cognitive sciences and particularly around um, short-term and long-term memory formation and things of that nature. So I gave you some readings, optional readings on that in the first couple of weeks of the course. But so that you've got a a bit of an understanding of the theoretical nature of how learning occurs in Queensland, um, you should have a basic level of this taxonomy. In practice, it mostly relates to four levels of what's known as the cognitive system, whereby students engage with retrieval, comprehension, analysis, and knowledge utilization. So, we should be able to measure students' learning in terms of those four different elements. And to do that, we have a, um, a series of what are called cognitive verbs, which are action statements that students can demonstrate 
those four different um, categories of understanding of knowledge. So for each of the subjects, there are cognitive verbs that are expected to be developed during their learning of those subjects. Now, in high schools, these cognitive verbs are generally mapped out and applied fairly rigorously, particularly in the final years of schooling, where they relate very explicitly to assessment questions. Of course, each assessment question will be designed around a cognitive verb, where students need to demonstrate their understanding of something through this action statement, which might be analyze, or evaluate, or investigate, or define. These are the cognitive verbs that form the foundation of the assessment. And this can be used all the way down into primary school. Indeed, all the way down to foundation, although much less so. Um, so you should at least be aware of this framework. It's not commonly applied yet, but it is the intent of the QCAA that this should be applied as a overarching framework in addition to the Australian Curriculum Assessment Framework in primary school education. So I've given you a breakdown of the different year levels and which cognitive verbs should be developed in each of the year levels for the two subjects in the technologies um, curriculum. So there may be, you may end up in a school where they are applying the cognitive verbs and you'll need to incorporate those into your assessment. And I've provided you with a series of graphic organizers, which are simply little examples of where you can incorporate different cognitive verbs um, into the teaching of technologies education.